But what we're going to look at here is instruction to rich people. Okay, so let's look at this. Remember, it's a pastoral letter being set, sent out broadly to all the churches, and we're going to tie this back into us. James chapter 5, verse 1, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your, your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped, you have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. The cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the uh, Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Pray you richly bless it. We commit this time to you. Thank you for just how you have ministered to our hearts from this book, and pray that this would also richly minister to us tonight. I pray for your empowering in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you got it just from the entrance uh, into the, this chapter in verse 1. These are warnings. This is a harsh, strong warning. In fact, you find the same kind of statement at the beginning of this section as we did earlier in verse 13 of chapter 4, where it says, go to now. And it's like a prophet that's calling out uh, to the people of God to repent, to give heed, to listen and to, to repent of their sins. And if you look at it, if you look at this text, really we're going to divide it, and it just naturally divides into two simple parts, a call to repentance and the cause or why there's repentance needed. So a call to repentance and the cause for repentance. And the call to repentance is found right there in verse 1, and it is to rich men, and I do want to focus back on this. How can we determine, based on this text, what we just read, from this text, how can we determine if somebody qualifies as somebody that's rich, according to this text? Because I think all of us would agree that when we talk about somebody who's wealthy, it has to do with a certain capacity or ability. And there's some abilities in this text. A rich person doesn't necessarily use these. And I hope if somebody is a believer and they're rich, they're not using their wealth in this way. But they have the capacity to use it this way. So let's, let's look at it. If you can look at this text, what is it in this text that helps us understand? What are the abilities of somebody who's rich? Anybody have any ideas? What's the ability of somebody who's rich according to this text? What can they do with their money? Anyone? What's that? Okay, they can travel. And let's, let's go down and look at that. That would be in verse 5. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You've nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. So they, they can actually, with money, buy pleasure. They can, they, can, they can exchange that paper or coin in their day and get pleasure out of it. And they do that. They do it abundantly. But again, somebody who's wealthy doesn't have to do that. These are, these are unrighteous or wicked rich. And what they're doing is they're doing it not just a vacation in a you know, nice conservative manner once every periodic period of time or whatever. They're, they're doing it all the time. They're just living in pleasure through their money. What, what's another ability you have in the text? Okay, they can hire others. Very good. Okay, let me ask a question about that. Have you ever hired somebody? Okay, have you ever hired it? To mow the lawn? Okay, you've hired someone. Okay, you know there's a huge part of the world that can't hire someone. There's a huge part of the world that doesn't really have significant funds to be able to buy pleasures. Right? Okay, what else do you have in the text? They, they have an ability. The other two might be a little bit more difficult. Let me help us with them. The first one is this. They have the ability to accumulate wealth. Okay, they can accumulate it. 
And then lastly, they have the ability, though hopefully somebody who's a believer wouldn't do this, but they have the ability to affect justice. They have the ability to affect justice. That does happen all throughout the world and in the United States. Justice is affected through money, all right? So just, and there's other things we could add in it, but if we just look at the text alone, someone who's, who, who's rich has this ability at their disposal. Though they may not use it, they have this ability. They have the ability to accumulate wealth, hire workers, purchase pleasure for themselves, and could even, if they so choose, affect justice. Now, how many of us qualify in, in this category when you put that together, right? I don't, again, please don't raise your hand. Don't, you know, we're not looking for any type of like numbers. <laughs> we're not gonna have you raise a hand. How many have this much? Anybody have above that? You can, if you don't have above that, you can sit down. <laughs> you know, we're not gonna do that, <laughs> all right? We're not, we're not wanting any, we're not wanting to quantify anything, but we're just trying to say, okay, probably everyone here has a bank account. Most people have either cash or a card they can use on them right now. Um, not everyone, and within the United States, there are not people that can easily go out and hire workers, buy pleasures, certainly not affect justice, and they have not really accumulated. Well, there are people in the United States like that, okay? And that, that is perfectly fine. But if you can do that, right, you, you would qualify as somebody who is rich, according to this text. So let's look at this. If we look at the Western world and the middle class, middle class Western world and up, virtually all of that is in this category. I was raised in this category, all right? Now, when you look at this text, who are the rich people in this text being called to repentance? Well, let's just really clarify this. It's not, it's not all rich people, okay? Not all rich people are being called to repentance in this text. In this text, though, and we could add on to that just to say we can go to the Old Testament, New Testament, and find people of wealth. But in this text, there are people who use their wealth in an unrighteous or wicked way. Those are the people that are being called to repentance. And I think that is really something that we need to look at because that's what we have. If you look at, again at verse 1, go to now a call to repentance, give heed ye rich men, and here's the call to repentance, weep and howl. <laughs> that is a strong call by this pastor to all those rich people within the churches that are still practicing this. If they were in the church and they're true believers, they haven't been transformed in this area. They haven't allowed the gospel of Jesus Christ to touch them in this area. If they, if they are in the church and they're espousing this and they're hard-hearted about it, it may be an indication that they not truly in the church, that they're not truly believers. And so this is really a call to everyone in the church that are rich and that are engaged in this kind of unjust, wicked practice of the use of money. Now, that doesn't mean that accumulating wealth is wicked. That is the capacity. That's in the first part. The wicked part of this has to do later on in the text and what they use their money for, right? It all has to do with the usage of it. So let's look at this. We could go to other texts. If you went to 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, I'm not going to do that right now. You can read of the danger of riches. It says that within riches are many foolish and hurtful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. It says that through this love of these riches, they've erred from the faith. They've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But if you look at the text, why repent? Look at verses 2 and 3. In verses 2 and 3, what we have there is we have two main reasons to repent. The first is simply this, the temporary nature of earthly treasure 
And the second is the coming judgment. The reason these people who have unrighteously used their riches are called to repent, even with this kind of call of howling and weeping, is because what they have amassed to use for their own their own pleasure, to use for their own purposes, to use in an unjust way, what they have amassed in that way is all temporary, and they'll be held to account. That's what it says in verses 2 and 3. Look at that. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, note this. The temporary nature of it is seen in the effects of sin upon it. And the effects of sin isn't talking about what's in us. It's talking about the nature of of wealth. Uh, Wealth, by the nature of what it was at this time, had the potential of being, uh, what would we say, diminished in value because of rust, corruption, moths, they found, they found their wealth in things like gold. They found their wealth in things like clothing and in grain. All those can be attacked by the effects of sin. And that's what you have with, within the text. In fact, you also see not only is there the potential of the effects of sin, and we have other texts like that. I want to read one of them out of Matthew 6, 19 talks about these treasures on the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Now, we know that the effects of sin can be corruption. Uh, We're coming up on our 30th wedding anniversary, and somewhere we have my wife's dress. I think it might be down in Houston. That'd be kind of neat to bring it up here. (laughs) I don't know what kind of condition it's in. What's always the danger? What do you got to do with a dress? I mean, what's the danger to clothing? Well, moth, deterioration of the quality. Have you ever gone to something that's been hit by mildew? It, it's, it's some sort of material, and then you go to, to grab it, and it just kind of flakes apart. I was also a coin collector when I was a child. Some of you are coin collectors. What happens, though, <laughs> copper won't rust. What happens to it after a while? It begins to tarnish. I have some coins I was very proud of that were nice and shiny as a young boy. I knew they had a little bit of value and they're super shiny. Now they're not anymore. It's just the nature of that. And this is what's going to happen. But also, you know, there's the effects of sin also touch the matter of uh, sinful acts. Uh, back in 2013, in January, my coworker came back from the States and he brought me a gift. It was my first MacBook Pro computer. And I was just amazed. I, I, it was this very generous gift he brought. He was trying to maybe convert me to be a Mac user, and he was successful. But I, I had that for about six months until somebody broke into our house one night, and they stole it. And we got a lot of stuff back from that robbery. It was really amazing, amazing story for another time, but we did not get that MacBook computer back. But you know what I had on that MacBook computer? I had an anti-theft program. So after a little bit, I kept looking at I turned on that anti-theft program, and all of a sudden, after a little bit, it pops up about five hours away in the capital city of Cameroon. And now, remotely, I'm able to look at the person that's looking at my computer. And I'm looking at them. I look at people who come and visit. I not only that, I am looking at keystrokes they are typing in. I'm getting his passwords. I'm finding out all this information about that individual. Even one time, he's there, he's looking, he's out on a deck. I know exactly where he is. I have a map location of exactly where he is for my anti-theft program. And uh, I'm watching him, and sure enough, here comes a police officer, a buddy of his, standing looking at the computer, too. I have his picture. I have all these pictures. I eventually took that information because it went black after a while and there were no more hits on it. And I reached out to him. I wrote him. And guess what he did? He wrote back. (laughs) He said, I'm so sorry. 
they gave me the computer to try to uh, clear out the memory and re-put on the operating system, and I did that, and I gave it back to them. I don't really know who it was, just somebody contacted me at the market, that's what I do. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, so you, you can have that. Didn't get my computer back, but I got a picture of some people. I think I also got a picture of the thieves because that was an earlier picture before it went to that guy. But these effects of sin, what is something else that makes, makes riches so temporary? Not only the effects of sin through corruption and theft and things like that, but also the nature of death, the nature of death. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but you know, you, you have this one, these people that think they can take it with them, right? We have these little statements we make about those kind of people. And honestly, I love my grandpa, and I've mentioned him before. My grandpa, that's what was, that was said about my grandpa. And he just was very much that way. He did, no one ever takes it with them, right? In fact, you know the story out of Luke 12 about this uh, rich man that brings forth plentifully and he's going to build more barns. He says this in verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for what? Many years, right? And what does God say to him? Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So years he thought he had, but in reality that night was the end. He didn't bring anything with him. But one of the clearest statements is found in 1 Timothy 6, 7. It says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can do what? Yeah, we can carry nothing out. So that temporary nature of the earthly treasure really makes that this wicked rich person with the wrong perspective of just hoarding up for themselves and their pleasure for long years to come to be able to bask in all their pleasure and use it however they wish, it really is to call them to repentance. But the second point's very strong. It's the coming judgment for sins. It's really for their sins, their inappropriate use of this. And it says this in the latter part of verse 3 where it says, ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. And really, there's two different ways of taking that. I prefer the way that looks at this as heaping unto themselves treasure of wrath. And the idea, if you just look previous, it says this. It says, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were by fire. The rust of what? Of their treasure is going to do what to them? Eat their flesh as it were by fire. And then this statement, and you've heaped up that of which its rust will eat your flesh by fire. You see, it's a picture of judgment. You've heaped all this up that in the end will be your judgment. And it is said in this text to be a witness against them. They've heaped it up. They've heaped up this treasure of judgment against themselves. It says this in Romans 2, 5, and 6. It's very similar. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And though that's not talking about riches in that text, it has that same idea of just heaping up the wrath of God. Then you have this out of Ezekiel 7, 19. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls. There's that idea of, of just giving themselves with their money to fill themselves up with their pleasures. Neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. So there is this call to repentance because of the temporary nature of earthly treasure and the cause for repentance. Oh, I'm sorry, and the coming judgment for their sins. That call is to these rich men, rich people, that have wickedly, unrighteously, unjustly used the gifts of God, the wealth that's been given to them. Now, cause for repentance. Why is it that these people are being called out? And just three simple points. The first is that they were defrauding others. It says this, Behold, the hire of laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them have, that have reaped are entered into the of the Lord of Sabaoth, which is of you kept back 
uh, by fraud. And so this idea of kept back by fraud is the idea not just of delay, but of complete default. But if I could just for a moment, this is something repeated throughout the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 13, Jeremiah 22, 13, Micah 3, 5, Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15. This idea of not defrauding those that you've hired. Just listen to just some pieces of those verses. Out of Leviticus 19, 13, it says not to defraud your neighbor or rob them in this way. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. It says this in Jeremiah 22, 13. It says, woe to these kind of people who do what? That use his neighbor's service without wages. In Micah 3, 5, it talks about those who oppress the hireling in his wages. In Deuteronomy 24 and 25, it talks again of oppression of a hired servant. And it says that at his day, thou shalt give him his, his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee, against thee unto the Lord, and it be a sin unto thee. Now, when we were in Africa, we had much more possibility of hiring laborers to do different work for us. We had somebody that worked in our house. Christine was gone most all day. She was almost more like a traditional school teacher because she helped teach our kids and our coworkers' children. And we had somebody that worked in the house, usually five days a week, most often actually six days a week. We had people that would come. John the plumber, he would come. He was a great guy. Uh, Elvis, uh, he would come. He would do the electrician work and some other work. We had other people that would come and do work. You know, one thing I realized is that when the day was over, I had to give them their money. Why? Because John's kids needed to eat that night. You know, here we don't think about it that way. But believe me, not just John was setting his heart on that money that night. His wife, who knew that he had a job for that day, was setting her heart on it. And possibly the children were hopeful as well if they knew about it, that there was going to be the possibility of having something that evening a little bit more special. Or if they were really low, they would be replenished. It's very important to them. When it talks about setting their hearts on it, it's very much a real um, situation out in the world beyond the Western world. But it can even happen like that here. And to defraud someone is either to not to give them what is their just due or to hold it back from them. And it says this, that they will cry, I could provoke them to cry unto God and it would be a sin against whom? Against me. So I remember, it just, I knew these verses, I knew the necessity before that sun went down. If they were waiting for it, I had to get it to them. No matter what, I had to get them their money. It's a very important point. But somebody who has wealth and somebody who is unrighteous with that wealth, they have a power over the hireling. They have a power over the worker, you see? And sometimes they like to flex that power and either hold it back or in the end renegotiate or even not give it at all. Find some fault with what, with what they did. Say, up. Oh, I'm not giving you anything. You did this. And all the power is on their side because they are the people of wealth. It is a wickedness. It is an unrighteousness to defraud others in that way. Secondly, living in pleasure. This is far more than a casual vacation. Uh, please go ahead and take vacation. Uh, that's, that's fine. This is not talking about this. This is talking about, it's talking about just hoarding the money so that you can have a luxurious lifestyle all the way through, all your days. That's what it's talking about. And I don't, I don't even, even though the people that I know that are very wealthy, for example, the, this young man, Nick, I mean, I might have mentioned this before, Nick's parents at graduation for eighth grade didn't even give him a pair of new shoes for graduation. And it was required to have black shoes. Nick went out, he took his tennis shoes, and this is, his parents are multimillionaires. He took his tennis shoes and he painted them black with a can of spray paint. Okay. They were not living luxuriously. No wonder 
This guy had a humble spirit all the way through, and if I'm right, he went over to work charity work in California. That is not, this, this is not talking about eating out from time to time, or it's talking about somebody who is like the rich man in Luke 16, where it says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He joyously was living in splendor every day is the idea of the terminology there. And so this is what they are delighting. They're using wealth for their own pleasures. And lastly, oppressing others. Oppressing others. What do we mean by that? Well, it says this in verse 6, You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Well, why, is, why does he not resist? Because he has no power. All the power lies with the one who has the wealth. In most countries, that's the case. In most countries, if you go against somebody wealthy, that is the case. I have a good friend of mine. He went in partnership with somebody very wealthy and who has far more capacity than him to try to do a venture to try to help boys in kind of a ministry, kind of like a boys' ranch. And my friend invested a lot of time in that. I mean, significant amount of time where it would be worth, a, I, I would say, a lot of money. It's not just 10000 It's a lot of money. That's how much time he invested in this. Well, in the end, for that rich man, it wasn't going the way he wanted, so he started putting pressure on my friend, and basically my friend had to come out from it, and now there's a lawsuit. We know what that rich person's doing. Though their case, everything's documented on the side of my friend that's in favor of that. But what this guy's doing, instead of just giving him the money, what's he doing? He's pouring money, loads and loads of money into team, into a team of lawyers to try to just quench that whole thing. That's the United States. And this is the tendency, and that is what it's talking about. Now, here in the text, it's talking about even killing the just, but the fact is condemning and killing, and he has no power against the wealthy. And that certainly is the case overseas. I go on and give some other examples, but we need to close our time. I just want you to look at the bottom of your sheet, and I want to give you some principles or applications. We're just going to go through these. In other words, if we were to extract out of this some positive things for right stewardship of finances... For any of us, at any age, wherever we might be, just look at what it is. Think correctly. In other words, wealth is temporary. Consider it as such. But if you look at those two texts there, 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, and Matthew 6, 19 and 21 that I've listed there, they both show that through wealth you can have eternal influence. That's something to lock on to. Live in the fear of God. That should be in every case. Never defraud. Instead, always pay your obligations. Be merciful, not strict. Be generous towards others. We might have at some point in time somebody that comes in here, a contractor, do some work for this church. And let's say that they don't hit the estimate quite right. They forget to do something. Not out of a purposeful negligence. They just didn't count something right. Didn't count their lumber right. A, a bump in something. What would be a merciful way of responding to that? Come back, we understand, bring it to the church body. It'd be the merciful and right thing to understand his situation. That's the food on his table. It'll come out of his pocket. <laughs> It'd be right to be merciful towards that if it is a just, understood error or an adjustment in price. Things are crazy right now with prices on building materials and things. So, be merciful and not strict. Be generous towards others, especially the poor. Don't indulge in pleasures. Yes, there are pleasures. God gives us those things to enjoy. You can read that about, about that in Ecclesiastes. But, you know, it's one thing, I put it this way, I love ice cream. It's one thing to eat a bowl of ice cream, right? It's another thing to open a new carton, sit down with a spoon, eat the entire thing, when there's five other people in the, in the house with you watching your film that night. <laughs> and to sit there and just moan and delight over this ice cream you're eating. That's the idea of this luxurious spending. And I love ice cream. You ask anybody who stays at the house. I love it. But it's, it'd be two different things there, you see. And so don't indulge in your pleasures. And then lastly, instead of being 
instead of oppressing others, defend righteousness. Even if it costs you something, defend it. Defend righteousness and uphold that. So we just cl close with this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust does corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not bre break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I hope you understand and uh, the, the ideas here and that there are this broad application to all rich people. And some of that has crept into the church. He's having to correct it, whether it's to call someone to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ that still has this and it's showing that they're not true believers or someone who's a true believer and needs to be discipled or grow and be transformed in how they deal with their money. Believe me, that's the case. This, I, there, there are believers that can struggle in this area. And, and this is just a case of being needing to be transformed in the image of Christ. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and love. Just pray you bless.